This is James Helder, welcome to Full Court Football 24. We're in the Heston and Hyde Hotel today in Hounslow. Quite privileged to be joined by none other than Mike R. Hyde. How are you, sir? I'm good, thank you, James. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I've got to say, it's a great, great pleasure to get you on the channel, mate. Yeah. Um, want to look back a little bit today on your career, on your journey, how you got started uh, as a professional footballer, your, your upbringing and stuff. I know you're from Upton Park. Yeah, around that way. Yeah, around Newham like sort of way. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. I'm um, a Newham boy, really, and um, it's funny uh, that I used to live in a block of flats and one of John Chadozzi's brother, John Chadozzi's brother used to play for Spurs. I remember he took me to Orient when I was really, really young. So my first club I went to was Orient Football Club. I was really young, around seven or eight years old. I fell in love with the game. My dad was the first person that introduced me to football because he played my dad for a Sunday team, so I used to watch him. But then I went to Orient with uh, John Tadoji's brother, who lived in the same block of flats as us, so he took me to Orient, and then that became my first club, funny enough. So from I was about 10 years old, played for my school, obviously, I was, and I, I was at Orient for a number of years, just before scholarship times, before you get to sign your scholarship. But I didn't really know about scholarship and, and stuff like that. And um, I played for a very successful Sunday team, really good Sunday team, called Ridgeway Rovers. Uh, they're probably known now, people know them, because we had a couple of players in there, or one famous player that played for us. And, uh, the, the, the Sunday League was synonymous with good football. So, like I said, from eight years old, I was at Orient, but I also played for my Sunday team. And I had loads of scouts used to come to our games, you know. I remember kneeling at my dad's car, Tottenham, Everton, Liverpool. And we just stuck at Orient. Um, but I was lucky. I was lucky that I was in a Sunday team that I had so many good players in. Have you heard of a, of a book called Bounce? Have you heard I, of that book? I haven't, no. There's a book called Bounce where a fellow called uh, Matthew Say talks about people being born luckily in a certain environment or being born in a certain area or being born in a certain road and getting hours of training in a particular sport. Mm. I think when I look back on my beginning, it was similar to that. I was fortunate to be in a team with, with good players at such a young age. And we trained and we trained and we trained. And I've, after I've read the book as an adult, I've looked back on my career. I thought, you know what, my, my path is a little bit like what Matthew said. I was fortunate. So we were fortunate to have good coaches, fortunate to be with good players, fortunate my old man played, fortunate I, I trained every day. So my, 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 my destiny to become a footballer was at a young age. You mentioned a few famous players that played in the Sunday team. I think that's a bit of an understatement, really. Yeah. One of those players indeed went on to be one of the biggest global stars in the game. I don't really want to be name dropping, if that makes no, sense. I understand but that. It's a fact because David was a special player, but we had so many. So it'd be, it'd be unfair to the other players within that team for me to just sing like David. David was the number one because he made it number one, but at the time he wasn't. Mm. So he was the one that had the best career, the, the, the most fulfillment of his career. And he's a superstar. In our team, he wasn't. We had, we had several. So who, who else was in that I team? There was loads. We had loads of players. We had Richie Sutton, Glenn Sutton, Ryan Kirby, Jason Brissett, myself. So Campbell come through one time, David Beckham, Chrissy Day. I could go on. So we had, there were several players within our group that were special players because we won everything. So for me, I could have been gone to a club in East London, maybe a club in Stratford and played for a club, maybe other clubs closer to where I lived and mm. maybe not had um, the tutorage I had with these players. Does and the standard sense? of football that you exactly. were playing. The, 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 the influences I had with these players playing with good players so young, so often, for so many years, it enhanced me, not only me, but all the players that became pros within that team. So several, several of us became professional footballers from on that team. The, hence the reason why it brings me back to the book that I read as an adult, Matthew Syed, when he talks about bounce and them getting the right minutes, getting the right training over and over and over again. That repetition. Repetition. So I'm, I'm always been one that no one's born with talent. I've always believed that. I don't believe mm. anyone's more talented than anybody else. So I've always had this mentality, this psych, do you understand? Mm. I've always had this, well, I don't think I'm more talented than you. I just think we're both talented and I'm going to work harder what I do and you're going to work harder with you. So we, do you understand? I've never, mm. never well, I ever that. been in, in any time in my whole career where I've ever, I thought I'm better than someone, ever. I've never ever thought that. Because I've always thought that when I was younger, that you have to work at what you want to do, you have to work on what you do. So was yeah, that was my actual pathway from a young age to probably before I became gone into the academy system, if that makes sense. So I'm talking pre-academy, yeah. talking pre, I'm just talking a pathway before. So be a grassroots football, so to speak. Everyone starts at grassroots football. When I talk, hear people talking like grass football is raw, I say, well, everyone starts at grass football. We all start, every single player started through grassroots football. So it's something to, res to be respected. And if you start at a good grassroots club with good ethics, good morality, yeah. good uh, convictions, good attitude, by the leadership of that grassroots club, you've got a good chance of then going on and possibly becoming what you want, if that makes sense. Um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I truly believe that. So you, I watch grassroots football and I'm, I'm associated, with, associated with Essex County Football Association, where I'm a 
board member, and my job is to look, out, look after, I'm a representative of East London, so my job is to oversee certain boroughs in East London at grassroots level, and I look at some of the grassroots games, and I think these te the, the kids ain't been given the right opportunity to maximise their ability, because it's a little bit, wait, I know it's not professional, but it's what they're trying to teach some of the kids at grassroots level is not helping them. I was fortunate, like I said, to be at a grassroots club where as soon as I went there, the morality was right, everything was right. You know, um, how we trained was professional without it being professional. So it was just right, right, best practices we was doing at the time. And it doesn't mean how you play, it's just how you talk to young players, do you understand, and get the best out of young players. And I was fortunate enough to be, um, my pathway, I was fortunate enough to be in a pathway where we was spoke to, to correctly, but also very demanding. Mm. People that I was around was very demanding. My own man was very, very demanding. So he set the trend. Then I went to, to managers who were very, uh, very grassroots managers that were very demanding. But I didn't break. It just made me better and it made the team better. So that has been my pathway. Without that, uh, obviously, I'll be saying I wouldn't be. Obviously, without that, I don't think it would have gave me the, sorry, without that, I don't think it would have gave me the, the minerals and the robustness and the resilience to maybe cope going forward as I got older. Let's talk about that transition from Sunday League or grassroots football into making that academy, that academy life. So I'm right in thinking Leighton Orient would be the destination for you. That's right. So Leighton Orient was my club. So I wrote, it was my local club. Um, and I didn't understand. You see, like, you know, now we know about the premiership and you know about the money that can be made and all that. When I was coming up, uh, 25 to 30, it, well, it wasn't so much like that. It was just football. So I didn't, I wasn't thinking of a career to, to get paid and all that. I didn't think I could be. Really, you were just thinking, honestly, I, I want to play I, football? Me and my family didn't. Me was going into the dark. We just loved the game. My dad played, but we, I never I remember ever sitting down with my mum or my dad and talking about what should we do next. It was never the case. Not like how I talk to my children now. Do you understand? I'm fully awake of the academy system and how it works. So I was, I was playing off pure enthusiasm and adrenaline. Um, I left Orion at a time when I shouldn't have really left Orion because now I started to get a bit awake of West Ham and all these bigger clubs and my mates were playing for West Ham, so I wanted to play for West Ham. So I left Orion, went West Ham at a very bad time. I broke my ankle and then I had no club. So a period when I should have been focusing on Orion and trying to get a scholarship, which I know, know all about now, at the time I didn't. I left, went, went to West Ham, broke my leg, West Ham kicked me out, so I weren't, I weren't playing no football at 16. So that simple, your that injury, simple. you're out the academy. I left Orient, went to West Ham, broke my ankle. Obviously, West Ham already got their players. So all of these things I didn't know about. They must I'm have had a, a, a very good academy, West Ham, as well at that time. Some uh, great players in there. That's uh, very good. I mean, it was an academy. You would expect most academies to be decent. So they had a decent, I wouldn't say very good, outragedly great. Um, but yeah, they had, a, they had a, good, a good academy. My mistake was leaving and going to them because I'm thinking I'm going to a club where I'm just going to go and get a club. But I'm competing with boys that have been there for years, yeah. which is what I'm aware about now. Do you understand? Yeah. So these things I wasn't aware of when I was younger. I'm going to go and leave Warrior to go to West Ham to do what? They've had six or seven players they've had for years that they to get the scholarship. So I have to be exceptional. Was I exceptional? No. So my mentality at the time was to just go and leave the club. I didn't realise. Do you understand? I didn't understand. I didn't understand I should stay at Orient because I'll get a scholarship there and that would be my pathway. Interesting. Very. <laughs> so, after that, went to West Ham, broke my ankle, didn't get a scholarship, so what do I do? No club. So I studied. So when people was doing their first year scholars, the players I played at Ridgeway, the players that I played for the county with, the players I played for my district with, they're all at clubs now, doing their first year scholar. West Ham, Orient, Man United, Spurs, Arsenal. I'm not there now. How'd you ankle. deal with that? get on with it. I've always been someone that's been never, like I said, if I, didn't, if I wouldn't, wasn't brought up the way I was brought up, I wouldn't be able to do with it, do you understand? But because my dad had really given me resilience from a young age, he was really hard on me from a young age. Not hard to the point where I would break, just, son, you need to do more, do you understand? You can't play football, there's 22 players, what are you going to do? You're going to just go, you can't, you have to do something. So I already had that mentality of I can, I, I can do it. I already had that robustness. When, I don't know what it is, what I had at the time, but I could only call resilience. Yeah. So anyway, <clears throat> after not playing for a year, after everyone's played, everyone's doing their first year, I went and studied at Wolfram Forest College. Done a business and leisure course. Of, done a business and finance course at Wolfram Forest in my first year as a scholar because I had no club. I was still playing for the, the county. Mm -hmm. I remember playing a game for Brimsdown, who had... Ridgeway had emulgulated into Brimstone. So after everyone else got their scholarship, Ridgeway folded because everyone's gone now, haven't they? Everyone, all the best players the have best been picked off. Gone. Everyone's gone to their scholarships now. Everyone's doing their first year scholarships. But Ridgeway then moved into Brimstone. So I know Brimstone was still about, so I still play Sunday football for Brimstone. 
going college, mind you, studying, playing Sunday football for Brimstone. And then Gary Johnson. Gary Johnson is now manager of... Uh, he might be manager of Yeovil. But Gary Johnson was a manager of Cambridge United at the time. Came to watch one player at Brimstone, saw me. He took three of us to Cambridge. And that's where my career started, basically. How much do you credit him with that, that initial... That initial uh, that no, initial moment of giving you a chance to, to apply your trade. No more than I credit my own man. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't look up to him like he, he, he saved me. I don't know. I don't, I don't credit him like that. The credit that I really give to my career is my dad and my Sunday league manager. They're the ones that set the, the, set the, the way I play, the, the way I think, my mentality. So I was the kind of player that, the type of player that liked to get on the ball. I come from an era where you see, everyone's talking about this football, pass it around and all this and all that now. I was playing like that years ago, and there was players playing like that years ago, but there weren't too many managers that wanted players to play like that years ago. I'm telling you the truth. So basically, I, 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 um, I credit um, my career, firstly to my parents, and then I, I got to go to my Sunday league manager who encouraged me to play the way I wanted to play. So then I would go to other places, and they will ask me to play in a certain way. So Cambridge didn't play the way that I wanted to play. Interesting. Understand? Yeah, I understand. So Cambridge used to play a different kind of style of football. They're playing like long ball indeed, stuff. Indeed, which yeah. I never agreed with as a youngster. Do you understand? I never agreed with it. So how do I, how do I, how do I overcome? How do I conform? How do I make it? Do I play like how they want me to play and just boot the ball everywhere? Or do I be good at what I am and show them how good I am? That's what I did. So that wasn't down to Gary Johnson. That wasn't down to anyone else. That's down to me understanding the game from the parents that I had and, and uh, my manager. So now when I coach, I coach exactly the same thing. When I coach, when I coach, when I'm developing youngsters, I tell them exactly the same thing. If you want to play in a certain way, if you want to get the ball down and pass it, and you're with people that don't want you to do that, what are you going to do? You have to be well at it. So I, that's the way I teach them. Yeah, so if you want to get the ball down and pass it, you've got to do it well. If you want to drop into pocket and play football, like I've got a player now that's under my under-18s, under he doesn't see himself as a centre forward. And I can see him in sometimes in training, he's frustrated because he said, I don't want to play as a centre forward, I don't want to play as like a number 10. So I said to him, who's stopping you? Who's, who's no one's stopping you. The only thing that's going to stop you is if you go and play and go into a number 10 position on a Saturday and fail. Do you understand? Then they're going to say, you can't do that. But that's just what I'm saying. You have to have conviction about what you're doing. And when you go into that number 10 role, succeed. And then you know what the manager does? He plays you next week at the number 10 role. So this is what I learned as a, as a youngster. Do you understand? I have to do me. I have to be in control of myself. I cannot worry about you. I cannot worry about that coach. I cannot worry about that coach's coach, the assistant, that person and that person. I have to know what's uh, most important to me. That is why I was successful in my career, because um, I only controlled what I could control. What do you remember about your debut for Cambridge United? Uh, I remember wearing yellow boots. I remember my parents being there. I remember being very nervous in, 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 the, in the changing room, very nervous. And I remember going on the pitch and having fun, ultimately. Yeah. That's what I remember. Was it hard for you adjusting to that league? Such a physical league and no doubt you're only probably, what, 18 at the time? Yeah, 18. Yeah, At the time I was the youngest captain in the country as well, which is a, an accolade. It's quite an interesting accolade yeah, was, to was, have, isn't it? At the time I was the youngest captain in the country and I remember the newspapers coming down to my mum's house and, uh, and doing an interview and uh, making them really proud. So yeah, and uh, for me it was... I, I took things into my stride. Um, you know, I'm not one to say I come from a particular background, you know, because it doesn't matter what background you come from to be successful in life. I don't think there's any sort of background for anyone to be successful, but I come from a working class background that, that I knew from school, I knew how to graft. Do you understand? I knew that things wasn't given. I knew that you couldn't take, but you must know how to take and get things out of life. Do you understand? So when I went into the first team and played football with them guys, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't that daunting to me, to be honest with you, if the truth be told, James. It wasn't, it wasn't daunting. And I was a bit cocky, a little bit arrogant, mm. and a bit of, had a bit of belief about myself. Like I said, I never thought I was the best, but I had a bit of belief about myself. So to go into the first team, it, it didn't seem that daunting. Played 106 games for Cambridge United, mm. racking up quite a lot of appearances for the club. A uh, lot of teams were off sniffing about and looking mm. at you. What was the reason for the loan spell to you on Palo? Yeah. Right there. When I, this is an interesting one. So I'm going to try and keep it short and sweet. When I got pro, so I'd done a six month pro, I'd done six months scholarship at Cambridge. Like I said, I didn't do first year, so I'd done a six months. After that six months, the manager said to me, I'm gonna give you a professional contract. Ah, oh, brilliant. So my first pre-season, he called me in and he said to me, Micah, 
a great man as well, Tommy Taylor. He's, he's a fantastic man, Tommy Taylor, by the way. He passed away now. He was a massive influence on my career because of this. He said to me, Micah, I don't want you to do pre-season with us. I want you to go away and play in, in, in Finland, in the Champions League, whatever they was in, Champions League qualifiers. It's competitive. When you come back, I'll make you captain. Now, I'm 17, 18, or elvers at the time now. My first ever time, I've uh, been given a professional contract. My first pre-season as a professional, the manager just pulled me in the office and told me, sending me to Finland. I looked in his face, I said, yeah. all right, Gaffer. And he said, and I left the, left the office. I found my mum and dad crying, crying. My eyes, I'm, I couldn't, I'm just crying. You didn't see the vision that he had? See, all I'm saying is he's sending me off. That's all I'm hearing, you understand? <laughs> I'm not doing pre-season and I'm going to Finland. I can't hear nothing else. I can't hear about, it's for your development and we don't believe. Because he told me why. I'm not hearing it. So I phoned my mum and dad, but crying, bawling down my eyes, you know. They're getting rid of me already and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, I went out there for three months. Greatest three months of my life. Really? Honestly, oh, I learned so much. Independence. In, in what way? Independence. Yeah. In, 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 I learned to be independent. I was on my own. I got my own flat. I got a car. All these things just enriched me as a player. Mm. So instead of me playing, doing pre-season, playing pre-season games with Cambridge and doing a pre-season You're playing program, playing Champions League qualifiers. I, exactly. I was straight away involved in this Champions League qualifying games and seeing all different kind of things that my peers, my age or peers back in Cambridge would never, I haven't seen. I was, Interesting. I was, I, I was brilliant. Uh, fantastic. When I came back, I was so enriched. And on top of that, when I came back, my gaffer was true to his word. When I came back, he made me captain. See, he gave, made, made me captain. So it made me more mature. Obviously, what he saw, um, he didn't know how it would work out, but it worked out for the best because it made me more mature when I came back. Do you look, do you look back at your time at Cambridge with fond memories? Um, Is it something that you treasure? Definitely. I love Cambridge. All the clubs I've played for, I love. And they've all treated me well. I love I loved Cambridge. I love the, the, the family spirit about it probably that's why I liked Watford maybe because Cambridge got a family feel about it you know and I, I loved it there um, everything about it what I learned the learning wow I learned so much as a person as a person as a player different styles because I was playing under John Beck who had a, compl a unique style really a completely new you, you talk about Wimbledon and Longbourn and all that his style was unique and tricks gamesmanships how, how, how to go about winning games um, I wouldn't call him dirty tricks at all but I learned so much and it was absolutely terrific. It was, it, was, it was a great experience. When Watford came in for you, what was your initial response? And was Graham Taylor the manager at the Graham time? Graham Taylor was the manager. When Watford came in for me, several clubs came in for me at the time. Um, I remember I had a, had, a, had a couple offers to go to different places to speak. So I, there was about three or four clubs that I was due to speak to. Watford was one. So when I say speak to, go down there, see the manager, have a look at the changing ground and then go on, go and speak to someone else and so on and so forth until the decision was made. Yeah. I went to Watford and I didn't go anywhere else after. Really? It's serious. I went to Watford. Well, you just felt at home straight away. Home. I was meant to go other places after. I went to Watford, trained, spoke to Graham. Uh, loved, I liked the things Graham was saying. I liked the things what Graham wanted. Um, I didn't you go instantly anywhere. got on with Graham straight away. Graham. And uh, I trained with the team. I obviously looked around the place and after speaking to Graham, I just decided to sign there. I didn't look anywhere else, didn't go anywhere else. Just signed there. Um, and it was a good move for me in my career. Very good. Let's talk through that, that initial period at Watford. Um, how did you start off playing for them? For Watford? I know Graham was interested in me from my time at Cambridge. Like I said, I, there was a few clubs interested in me. Uh, and I knew I was going to be sold. I knew that. Club had, you know, it was... It was funny at Cambridge, really. You know, normally you're a club and at Cambridge, everything was so nice. You know, I knew that I'd done my time there and they was grateful for what I'd done. And was it quite, they're quite accepting in the fact that very, they knew you were going to move yeah, on? very, extremely, extremely. Um, and, and they've been like that with most of the players that I, when I was in my time. So Jody That's Craddock, great to see a club like yeah. that. Yeah. Jody Craddock was there when I was there. He went and had a great career, Wolves and something. And we played together and he was the same. Danny Granville, another one. He went yeah. on to have another great career. He was from my youth team at... Cambridge, another one that went on and they wished him all the well. So it was really, really good. And then I got very fond of memories of Cambridge. But yeah, Watford came in. I went to speak to Watford, spoke to Graham, trained. I just liked it. Come home, said to my dad, you know, I'm not interested in going anywhere else. I think maybe because it was a little bit local as well. Mm. To be honest, it was not too far from London, not too, too far from my family. So that helped. And it just went on from there. Went in there and it was just, my career just went on. Who was the big characters in that Watford dressing room when you first signed? No, there was a few. When I signed, he signed several players at the same time. Sorry. When I signed, he signed several players at the same time. Jason Lee was in there. Really? He was a big character. And then while I was there, Ronnie Rosenthal come along. Alan Nielsen come along. 
Epson Boston came along. And you had, you had people like Tommy Mooney there. You had Robert Page there. Robert Page, what a player Good he was. Good player, centre half. Richard Johnson was there. Peter Kennedy had come, which was another mad Irishman. Dominic Foley, we had a guy called Udi Muta. There were so many characters while I, while I was there, and I could go on. Michelin Gongi, who helped us get promotion one year. A French lad, he was terrific. There's Little. We had a good career at Knox first before he came to us. So there was, there was loads of players, loads and loads of big characters there, to be fair. What was the atmosphere like in the squad? Did you guys have sort of card schools? Was there banter amongst the players? Loads. Is it? Loads. Yeah. I'm not sure if you could win back-to-back -back promotion like we did and not have the banter and team spirit we had. That we had camaraderie. Trouble. Yeah, we, had, we won back-to-back -back promotion. So we had great team spirit. We weren't the best team. Like I said, I wasn't the best player. But we had great, great, fantastic team spirit. So to beat us, you had to do well to beat us because we had fantastic team spirit. And... We demanded of each other as well. So not everybody got on, and you can't expect everybody to get on in a, when you've got a squad of players. Of course. Great if you, great if you can. <laughs> but you can't expect everyone to get on if you've got a squad of players. But what's more important than them getting on is them getting on on the pitch, which I think is very important. Understanding your role, your responsibilities in the, on the pitch, and do it. And we, we was demanding like that as a, as, as a Watford team. Can you remember your debut for Watford? Yeah, against... Sure, it was against Burnley. Yeah, it was against Burnley. Funny enough, the team that I went on to represent yeah. after. Yeah, it was. It was against. It's against funny Burnley. when people have a good game against the club. Yeah. They always end up signing from in yeah, the future. From, yeah. Notice the pattern with this. Yeah. So Burnley was my was my. I think we won one nil as well on my, on my debut. So yeah, I do remember that. I'd like to fast forward you to the season that you won promotion, mm -hmm. not into the Premier League. The season before that. Yeah. What do you remember about that year? Yeah, good. The season before we got into the Premier League, I think we won the. Uh, was it the championship? Yeah, it would have been in the championship. I'm not sure. I can't remember if we won it. But that season, we went through a little blip. Uh, and then after towards the end, we, we finished really, really, really strong. And I remember we were steamrolling teams in that season. I remember going down a tunnel. We said intimidate teams. In really? The tunnel. Yeah, we said intimidate teams down a tunnel. We said win. But it was funny. Give me a look into it. Give me a hindsight so into that moment. We'd be in a tunnel and there'd be another team next to us. And we'd just be saying things. Like, I'll be shouting at things like, I don't even want to say the things I was saying in case people know. Because <laughs> I say it now to the youngsters, you know, I'll try to get them going by saying the same thing. So I'll just say, to them, it's time to go to work. This is a work day. You know, this is not, this is it's time. It's, it's, this, is the, this is that day. We're at the office now. It'll be things like that. You know, yeah. this is an actual work day. This is, this is not a time now. You know, it's three o'clock. Now it's time to go to work. It'll be that sort of attitude. Mm. But there'll be three or four of us in the changing room doing it. I'll be leading it. I'll be at the back because I used to come at last. So really? I'd be at the back. I used to always, if I weren't captain, I used to like coming out of the back. So you've got that impression, you're not at the front, yeah, but you're going to leave a last yes, impression at the yeah, back. Yeah, so if I'm not at the front leading, I want to be at the front pushing, if that makes sense. Mm. I, I didn't like to, I'd either be at the front or I'd be at the back. Oh, uh, sorry. So at the back, I'd be shouting at the back. It's work time. I'd be shouting, it's work time, it's work time. And then the other boys would be on it. Do you know what I mean? They'd just be on it. And it's time to go to work. It is, it's office time. We're, 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 it's time. This is what we were, we're, we mm. run into Friday. We, we work for this. So we'd be intimidating people in a, in a tunnel. We used to do it in the second division. We won it, we done it. And then in the first division, we carried on doing it. So it was something that we, like I said, our team spirit was, we weren't the best talented team, but we had a great team spirit. So before games, we was on it. You know, was Elton on John it. the chairman at this time? Pardon? Was Elton John yeah, the chairman? Yeah, Elton John was about, yeah, yeah. What yeah. was he like when you won the, what be the championship, if yeah. you like, to get promotion? It's the same as he was when he was distant. But when we won and was in the changing room, we'd come to the changing room. Really, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He'd be in it. When we won, that, whenever we got promoted, Elton was about. Whenever I was at, when I was at the club, and I've been, I got promoted three times. When I was at the club, Elton came into the changing room after and, and said congratulations, stuff like that. So he wasn't a busy chairman by any means. You didn't see yeah. him. He wasn't yeah. about, didn't, you know, whether he But he was proud. Pardon? He was proud of the, yeah, the achievements yeah, yeah. of proud the lads. Yeah, of my achievements. Yeah, but you, you, wouldn't, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't hear from him during the season or there wouldn't be anything coming from upstairs, if that makes sense. I know in other clubs, there, there, is, you know, there is that sort of pressure. But it wasn't like that at Watford. It was, it was, like I said, it was a similar to Cambridge in that aspect as far as a family club was concerned. You know? it, was, it was very close-knit. Let's talk about the following season. Mm. Absolutely blitzed it to get... Promotion into the Premier League. Yeah. Gifton, Noel Williams up yeah. front, I think, yeah, if yeah, I remember. Yeah. Some player, Gifton. Yeah, Gifton was a young player. What can you tell me about Gifton, uh, Noel Gifton Williams? Gifton was a young player. He was in and around the squad um, the year before and the year before that. And he, and he he'd probably, <laughs> he would probably say he didn't make enough uh, appearances in that actual season. But the season before, he made numerous appearances. Um, he was a young lad, big, strong, used to get hold of it for us. And he went on to have a good career himself. You know? mm. He did. Young, and a young man as well, with a a mature head on his shoulders. What do you remember about that season from a personal point of view, from your own, from your own sort of memories and your own achievements? I remember Graham Taylor got, in, got ill in that season. Uh, we started off really well, had a little bit, and Graham Taylor got ill. And while he got ill, when he was ill, 
we galvanised. Really? <laughs> really. So wow. while Graham was ill, Kenny took over. Obviously, Graham was ill, but Graham was in charge. But Kenny was taking over. I'm Kenny? Not, Kenny Jacket. Very okay. good coach. Another one that I'd, I've got a lot of time for. There's loads of people that's helped me in my career, you know. Gary Johnson being one. So I wouldn't like to like to go back on that when you said that he, he's, he, he's one of many people that I, I've, I'm grateful for for my career. And Kenny is another one. So Kenny took over the team. And for nine games, we galvanised while, while Graham was out. And then towards the end, we just hit the ground running. And I remember we went into the actual Wembley against Bolton. On the way there, on the bus, we knew we was going to win. I don't know. <laughs> It's something, I don't know, I don't ask me, that's the only game I've ever been in, probably, in my career that I knew. Dead certain. I knew he was going to win. And in the changing room, I knew he was going to win before the game. And then when we won, I knew it was, I knew he was going to win. That's the only game that I'd say that I've ever felt as confident going into the game. And that was probably the biggest game of, 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 of my career. It would have been probably the biggest career of most of the players in that changing room at the time. And that was yeah. the game to take you, to take you yeah, up into, yeah, it's into work. Yeah, yeah, it's the game that's going to get us to the Prem. We had to beat Bolton and... We did, and I knew he was going to beat him anyway, because the back, how we went into that game, it was that same, let's go to work vibe. It was the yeah. same, scare them, no one can, no, we're not scared of no one, no one can intimidate us. It was that same vibe going into that game that, that we was riding on. How did you feel playing at Wembley? I know the other, only other time you've been at Wembley was to watch England versus Italy, so it's a big, big moment for I felt like yourself. the boss. Really? Yeah, of course. I felt very bossy. I felt like the boss. I felt like I owned the midfield. I felt like... I, I'm the man. <laughs> yeah. I, I felt that's how I felt playing the game. That's how, not just me, well, I did personally, but I knew that we did as a team. Do you understand? I knew we, we all felt that as a team going into the game. We all did. We were supremely confident. Why? I don't know. But that's, that's probably the way you want to be going into a game of that magnitude. And we did. And, but I personally felt top of the world, mate. I felt, I felt unstoppable. If, if, they, if they're such a world. I felt, I felt like I was the man. Like I said, I never thought I was the most gifted, but on that day, I felt like I was the boss, <laughs> if that makes sense. And, and I always try to play like that in midfield anyway. I've always, I've always tried to play games like that, to be honest, that I'm the man and you can't beat me and outrun me, you can't outscore me, you can't outhead me, you can't outpass me. There's nothing you can do. And that's how I felt on that day. That epitomised everything that we were trying to work for. Brilliant camaraderie. You guys have won back-to-back -back promotions. Mm. You're now in the Premier League. You're now a Premier League player. Mm. Describe that... that moment that adulation when it sunk in what you guys have achieved it was good i think it only sinks in after them, them things moments like this only think sinks in after i can only talk the way i'm talking now after that after reflection so long. yeah 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 when i have to do interviews or speak like now i can i think i speak with a lot more clarity now and reflection of what's happened at the time it's all a, you're just getting through it so at the time I, I couldn't tell you really i got up played the game enjoyed the game win lose or draw i was more disappointed with probably the environment I was in, just truth be told. Which really? No qualm saying that, not at all. I, I, I felt that players, you know, uh, let the occasion get to them. You know, I thought it was conceding goals and losing games where we would have won, lost in the championship just because we was playing in the premiership, which I didn't, I didn't really want to, I didn't really believe because I thought, you know, a game of football is a game of football at the end of the day, you know. There's going to be quality in the, the higher you go, there's going to be more quality, but at the same time, you still got to do the, what you've got to do as a professional person. And I did... That's the only thing I felt that we could have done better as a team, honestly. But yeah, that's, that's on reflection. Is there always a worry when teams go back-to-back -back promotions and go up that the players that have got you there may not get a chance to represent the club in the Premier League? Absolutely. Is that something that players think about? I'm not sure. I'm, 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 I'm imagining so. Mm. I'm sure that was something that we possibly thought about, but we was given the opportunity to go and perform. Um, you look at clubs like last season, for example, use a, Fulham as an example. They got promoted when I bought a whole new team. The players that got promoted in, they kind of said thanks, but and then they didn't fulfil what they wanted to fulfil. Um, then you got to look at someone like probably Norwich. They've come up this season with more or less the same squad as last season. They've kept their squad. So we was fortunate in that aspect that they the club, probably because of the size of the club, James, because of the size of Watford, they had to probably stick to what we had and maybe add one or two players, and that's what they did. They probably didn't have the financial clout to go and replace everybody. Because um, it would have been maybe seen too much of a gamble. So we was lucky that we was um, given the opportunity to play in the Prem. What was a highlight for you that season? Whether it be playing wise or personal wise, personal satisfaction, what was a big, big moment for you? Playing wise? Playing in the Prem. Of the, at the, the whole season, there was, no, there was no one moment that I can uh, remember. You could say we won here or we won there. But uh, for me, just playing, just the whole playing part. Win, lose or draw, just trying to give my best and playing for me was, a, was, a, was an experience in itself. We won at Anfield, I think, 1-0. I could say that, but 
it was a win, a win's a win, and a, a loss is a loss, and a draw is a draw, you know. So, for me, just the whole season was a was was a, an experience. Talk me through playing for Jamaica. Oh, no, good. No doubt, it's something that you're exceptionally proud of. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the reggae boys as well at the time had a fantastic squad. Yeah, absolutely. The likes yeah. of Jamie Lawrence in yeah. the team. We have some, uh, um, we have some very, very good players. Players that would establish Marcus Gell, Francis Marcus Gell, yeah. Paul Hall, Dion Burton. So we had established players that I played in uh, the Prem. Some, yeah, established players that I was going to play for Jamaica. And it's a tremendous accolade to be given the recognition to play for Jamaica. I should have done it. I remember I could have done it two years earlier. Really? Yeah, but I was in the Prem. We just got promoted into the Premiership with Watford and I remember getting called up. I remember getting called up into the, into the Jamaica squad. Having a con Graham Taylor told me, you know, Jamaica's called up to the Jamaica squad. I sat down, we had a conversation. I spoke to Graham and I made the decision that I'm going to focus on my career that season. Being a Premier League player. So I've, I've made the decision that I'm going to focus on being a Premier League. I just got promoted into the Premier League, never been here before. Do I want to start playing internationally and you know or do I want to focus on and I, I decided to focus excuse me I decided to focus on my premiership career would that be a sole decision from yourself or was there uh, yeah, was it there a decision a sole, yeah it's a sole decision myself but I, I, I spoke to I spoke to my manager and I spoke to my family but obviously the decision then down to me I made mm. the decision but yeah it was influenced and guided and helped by other people's information but I made the ultimate decision um, but fortunately enough I still managed to play for Jamaica I think a year later so that, that, was, that was really good Jamaica's a great experience. Learning as a footballer to play international is, is second time I've, I've played internationally. Like I said, the first time was when I played in Finland, which was a fantastic experience. And I was fortunate enough to get another experience playing for my, representing Jamaica in my country. So, yeah, it was, it was really, really, really good. In that Watford side, I'm just having a look at some of the players you played with as well. Paul Robinson. Yeah, Robo, yeah. Fantastic yeah. player, Paul good Robinson. Player. Yeah, brilliant what can player. you tell us about Paul? Tenacious. Another, another player, you see, you look at players and you think that these players, you look at premiership players, and you look at players that they, they're really gifted and they're miles better. They're just tenacious and have an idea of what they're doing. That's what Robert Robert was a very good tackler, knew what he was good at, and he was tenacious and he worked really, really hard and he had a fantastic career because he, he deserved one. He went on and played numerous games for, for Birmingham, so as well as being a Watford legend, I'm sure he's a Birmingham legend now. So, yeah, he's another, another tremendous player. Was it a tough decision for you to leave Watford, having played... Over 250 games for the club, having been a big player for them, and yes. enjoyed success there, both both on and off the pitch. And it's been a very settled time for you in your life. Mm. Was it a hard decision to, to to make that choice to leave? Yes, it was hard, but it was all, it was it was it was hard as well. If I've got any regret in the game, it, the way I left Watford, not in a bad way. It wasn't. I didn't leave them in a sour way, but I never left in a way that. Uh, merited the time I'd been with them, if that makes sense. I never gave the fans a chance to clap or anything like that. It I didn't never... merit your achievements the way no, you left. No, not the way I left. Not, not the way I left. It wasn't Interesting. like... Interesting. I left because it was. It, it seemed like the club... was. Going, I was going through a little bit of a transition. I've been there eight years, you know. Did I need a change? Probably needed a change. The club was kind of half offering me a contract, but not really offering me a contract. So the door was half open. So they were really saying, you, could, you know, you could, if you can find a club, you can go. You know, but if you don't find a club, you can stay. So really, what does that say to me? Really, I need to probably find a club. So that's how, that's how I left Watford, really. And it's only now in hindsight when I look back and I, and I, when I go back to Watford and I get to speak to some fans that I bump into that... Watford I, fans really do hold you in a high regard exactly, even now. Exactly, yes, exactly. Uh, they, they, uh, they hold me in high regard, yeah. Um, and I hold them in high regard as well, but that's the only thing. When I left, I didn't get the opportunity to, 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 to say this. I didn't get the opportunity to probably play one more game where they knew I was going to leave. I didn't get the opportunity. It's like I just left and... I went to went to Burnley and, and that was that. Does it feel bad that you didn't get that closure? No, not really. You know no, I mean? no, 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 You're, not at all. It's what? not something you think about. No, 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 no. Uh, only because you're bringing it up, but it's not saying yeah, I regret. Yeah. I if, if there's that. one thing I would have liked to yeah. is that, but I didn't leave under any bad terms. You know, I didn't leave any sour. There was there was no sour grapes. There were no under no bad terms. Just it was a change, and I left. The club was actually going through a change as well. Ray Lewis was the manager, and we was going through a little bit of a transition. A little. It seemed like a little bit of a transitional stage, but I think two years before that, we we got. We had to get our wages subsidised because they went through a little bit of a financial, financial problem. The club did, and all the players had to take a 12 percent, and we all supported it and stuff like that. So it was, it was going through a bit of a stage, and it just seemed like they was kind of wanting me to stay, but probably maybe maybe it was a time for a change, which is fine, which is totally acceptable. If, like I said, I would have liked to have been able to probably 
I don't even think I even gave an interview or anything when I left at the time. Which you, well, I would have liked to have, if that mm. made sense. Because mm. I would like to have spoke to maybe the newspapers or something and said how much I loved my time. Clarified. There. Clarified, yeah, how much I loved my time yeah. there and how great Watford had been for me. And I still say it every time I, I speak about Watford, I speak in, in glowing terms, as I do with all my former clubs. Let's talk about the next chapter of your journey. Yeah. Signed for Burnley. Burnley. Yeah, undisclosed I fee. I don't know how much it was. I'm remember. guessing it was a few quid. I, do, I don't even know. And um, big signing for Burnley. It was interesting. T- t- talk me through that period. Very interesting. When I signed, it was only nine players. It was really, really? good players, though. Yeah. But it was really interesting. So they were trying to build a team when I got there. Um, so we had good players, though. John McGrew, Frank Sinclair, Michael Duff, who's now a manager. Uh, John, you had a good... Just focus on what a great player Frank Sinclair was. Uh, yeah, he was on, on his lad. I'm Fantastic. He's got a few own goals. Very unlucky with own goals. Yeah, we, he worked hard. He worked we've hard, had him on the it? channel and we, we've covered his, uh, his unfortunate, perilous own goals, own goals spell. Yeah, unfortunately. I hope you don't mind us bringing that up, Frank. No, but it shows you about resilience. That shows you about someone's character, you know, the characteristics of somebody, you know. So I, I'm sure you don't mind. It's not like we're bringing anything up. And that's just part of his... Part of football is part of history, Part of isn't football, it? yeah. It's part of football, you know. And he's had a great career. I wouldn't mind having his career and scoring a few own goals, you know. I'm sure many people wouldn't, so yeah. it's, it's, it's fine. Who was the manager at Burnley when you signed? Steve Cottrell. Steve Cottrell, mm-hmm. wow. How, how did you get on initially with Steve? Fine. Yeah. Yeah, we got on fine. Got on fine. He put me on a transfer list and took me off. I see that. So that was interesting. Do you think that shows that you, you've knuckled down and he's then sort of redeemed, redeemed you, brought you back and, and, and then said, no, actually, this lad can stay here? Possibly. Before Possibly. we get to that stage, what, what happened before that? Talk me through your day. I don't know, I'm sure. Maybe I weren't playing as well as I was. I'm not sure really what happened. Um, I was getting a bit older now, probably maybe not. Playing as well as I was, might have said a couple two things, voiced my opinion, not in the wrong, not in the wrong way. Um, he thought probably he needed a change, put me in the transfer list, no problem. I think a few weeks after that, still ca- carried on playing. He must have thought, well, that was a bad idea, and took me off the transfer <laughs> list. No problem. <laughs> He's back. Football, you know, either way, I didn't have no no problems with it. You know, I didn't, I didn't. So I'm guessing you're one of them lads. If you weren't in the first team, you're not going to sit there. You're not going to be a bad egg. You're not going to moan. You're going to no, knuckle no. down and graft. No. One thing I could say, the one thing I was lucky, James, that I never played reserve team football. I've always played first team football, that, you know, fortunately enough. So even when I was on the transfer list, I was still playing first team football. I've never been dropped in my career. So that, that, I've never been replaced by anybody and dropped and have to sit down for what, two, three weeks and fight for my position. Because I like to fight during the week. So that was ne- it was never a case of me spitting out my dime or anything like that. I think... He, he, he probably thought that he, he could maybe, I don't know, I don't know. He thought maybe he could get a few quid from me. Um, maybe he wanted to freshen it up. Took me, put me, I was on the list for about three weeks, two, three weeks, and then took me off. And then. The three seasons you was at Burnley, uh, yeah. I hope you don't mind me saying, you was one of their most consistent players. It, it's something that Burnley yeah. fans will acknowledge as well. You, you really did put a shift in for them week in, week out. Yeah, I mean, I was lucky. I was injury free. So I was fortunate to be able to be selected and I was fortunate to be selected, you know. So first of all, you've got to be able to be selected. That means you've got to be fit and be training. Uh, and then secondly, you've got to hopefully be selected. So, yeah, I was, I was injury-free, I was fit, I was selected. I enjoyed my time there, I had a great time. I think I endeared myself to the fans because I scored against the rivals. <laughs> um, so that, that endeared me to the fans. But I like to think I was honest with them. I like to think I put a shift in. And I like to think that I brought a bit of goal and a bit of quality into the midfield when I played, you know, like everybody else did in their position. So, yeah, like I said, Burnley's another club that I had great memories, fond, fond, great club, fantastic supporters, and they really did support, support their team, you know, and I had a great time up there. How would the Burnley compare to the camaraderie you had at Watford with the two seasons you got promoted? How does, I know it's hard to compare different time zones, different teams and players, but how would you... How would you compare the two? Yeah, yeah, it should be hard, really, but not, it wasn't so hard comparing Watford to Burnley because when I joined, like I said, we had nine men, nine players, signed players, so players was being added. So straight away, we had commandery because it was team spirit. So because it was small-knit, it was straight away, we had team spirit. We had Cameron Cam- 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 Marjorie. It was really, really good, you know, and the, the players that were there, all that experience as well, you know. Uh, we all came with, with our own experiences. Who was in the squad when you came John in? Who was, can was you there. remember the other eight players? Yeah, John McGrew was there. Frank came in. Um, Graham Branch was there. A player called Robbie Blake was there. Uh, Adi Akinbaye came in. Wow, the big uh, yeah, man. So Gifton came in. So I had to, me and Gifton played again together. For the, so me and Gifton played together twice. I think Adi, well, I, in my time, Adi, was, Adi went and came back. So Adi, Adi was there and went and came back. In some shape, him and he. Yeah, he was some shape. So I knew Adi as well from a schoolboy. From we used to play grassroots football when he was at Norwich as a, as a, as a schoolboy. So yeah, we had, uh, we had good team spirit. 
probably would have been a bit different if there weren't so many players of experience. Mm. But because we would have a bit of experience, it, it kind of helped, you know. So like I said, roles, responsibilities. I mentioned it earlier on, and we was demanding on Watford at that. So when you went, when I went to Burnley, we had experienced players that knew their roles and responsibilities again. So the team spirit was good. There was no one shirking that training, or you know, everyone was doing their job. And Would you guys go out in a group? Would you of eat course. together? Yes, of all course. All the usual stuff. Yeah, yeah, Christmas stuff. Uh, yeah, all the, all the all the usual stuff. Christmas dinners, nights out, and Manchester's a great night out, by the way. So, yeah, we used to have that quite often. <laughs> Manchester's a good a good place to go out. Interesting. How would you how would you summarise your time at Burnley? Positive. Really, 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 really good. Positive. We had a good cup run. Um, we stayed in and it stayed stayed. We was a, a competitive team, and I got to meet some really, really good people that I would not get, got to meet before. So yeah, it was a really good time for me. You made 102 appearances for Burnley in total. Yeah. Um, something no doubt you look back on with a lot of pride. Up next in your in your chapter and journey was Peterborough United. Yeah. Talk was, me through that. How did that? How did that manifest itself? I was 33 coming to not to the end. I was 33 and uh, I was in my last year of my contract with Burnley. Tommy Taylor, the person that brought, the person that gave me my captaincy at Cambridge so many years ago, was now at Peterborough. Interesting. Yeah. So Tommy Tommy called me. Getting the band back together, lad. Basically, Tommy called me and said to me, Keith Alexander was the manager, the great Keith, the late great Keith Alexander. I was only fortunate enough to play under him for one, one or two games. Fortunate, I say fortunate. I was fortunate to play under him for one or two games. So Tommy was like the director of football at the time at Peterborough. Called me and said, oh, you know, would you come down to Peterborough? We were, we were in League Two. There I was a championship player at the time. We were in League Two. I was 33. It was an opportunity for me to probably move back down to London now mm. after being away. Just had a, had a daughter, had a little girl. Wanted to be a bit home, closer to London. Peterborough seemed like a good fit. Plus Tommy was there. Um, so yeah, I went down to Peterborough. Was given a captaincy there, and again enjoyed massive success there as well under 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 Keith Alexander. Then Darren Ferguson took over under Darren McAntony, who was now the manager. Barry Fry was still about. Director. What was Barry Fry like? I've got to come on to him. He seems like from the outside looking in a real character. He is a real character. Yeah, real on his down to earth character. You know, mm. people say old school. What well, is old school? You know, he wants to get to. Early. So I'm not sure if he was old school, but he was yeah down to earth character, full of beans. Uh, colourful, enthusiastic, the kind of people you want around you, I suppose, the kind of people you want to work with. You passionate. Know? Passionate, yeah, yeah, he was a passionate person. So, yeah, he was kind of like the director of football. Tommy Taylor would come in as like the technical director sort of thing. And, and Darren McCanty was the new chairman. And then I went under there, under this new era. So when they started, when Darren McCanty kicked in and started doing really good stuff down there, I was one of the first people that went and, went and joined. So that was a really good experience for me. At this age, you're sort of 34 years old. Are, yeah. you, are you starting to think of your, your future outside of the game at this point? Yeah, yeah. You start, is, that, is that something that, as a player, that you have to take, take heed of? Yeah. Some people do it later than ever. I've started to do my badges and stuff now, so I probably would have my B licence. What really done it was when I was in the changing room at Peterborough. I was in the changing room. I'm thinking, as you see, you think it all in. I was in the changing room at Peterborough. Last one in there, just had a game, having a cream, wiping myself off, as you do, having a cream, putting my clothes in. The youth team players are in there sweeping. And I could hear there was from East London. I could hear in their accent they was from where I'm from. I could hear, so that's where you from, East London. What are you doing there? And then one of them whispered, uh, Barking Abbey, come through Barking I never heard of it. What's Barking Abbey? Oh, I said educational scheme. Never heard of it. Never heard of an educational scheme. Never heard of this Barking Abbey thing. I have now, because mm -hmm. they're everywhere. But I never heard of it at the time. So I went back to my hotel room. I said, that's interesting. An educational scheme that plays football for two years. Went on the, on the internet, I had to find, try to find out a bit. I said they had vacancy. Come talk to my under career, so I contacted them, you know, I'm interested, oh, this is very interesting what you're doing. I'm from East London, I'm from this area, I'd like to be involved, I would ya. So straight from football, after I finished playing, I sort of went straight into that. Wow. So I never stopped, so really once I finished at, at Peterborough, I sort of went straight into that. Funny enough though, I managed to get another league club after Peterborough. <laughs> I went and signed for Barnet for one year, but I already was already, had an idea about this education, where you, you get a qualification, or you get to play football for two years. So I got, got myself involved in that. Was Barnet like a last throw of the dice for you? More, well, I mean, more just a chance to, to enjoy your football before yes, you absolutely. put them boots on absolutely. the peg and not, not turn I'm, out anymore? Absolutely. If anyone knows me, they'll tell you, James, I could run all day. You look pretty player. fit now. I, I reckon you could turn day. out now. But I hate the gym. Really? I hate the gym. So I'm never a gym. I just love football. Yeah, yeah. So 
for me, Barney and, and, and play, it was just a chance to play football. So like, you're like, get the balls out first training yeah, session yeah, type yeah, yeah, of fella. Yeah, I'm that kind of person. Yeah, yeah. I'll get the balls out straight away. Yeah. Now I want to get the balls out. I'm not the player to touch the ball. You know, I'm not one for, you have to run. So, so uh, like I said, I was a good runner, very good runner. But like the gym and stuff is not for me. Well, like weights. Yeah, and, like even now, yeah. it's not for me. It's not. It's I can like, relate I'm to not, that. Not so I just like to play football. So yeah, any opportunity to play football, I want to, I want to play football. But Barney was, Ian Hendon gave me a call. Out of the blue, said to me, what, Mike, what are you doing? Uh, not doing much anymore, no. I'm just kind of retired, semi-retired or whatever you want to call it. Because after Peterborough, I played for Woking hmm. to keep fit. Woking, I played semi-professional to keep fit. And you know, like I said, I just wanted to keep fit, play football. And then he, he called me and I went down there, done a year, which was very interesting that year. Because we nearly got relegated but stayed up, which was really, really good for me because I was the captain at the time, <laughs> captain for that year. Didn't need that on his CV. No, I didn't need that on my CV. So, yeah, that, that's how that Barnet came about. So, I thank Ian Hendon for giving me that call. That was you officially hanging up your boots then? Yeah. What? How do you refocus yourself? I know you've gone into your, your, your coaching straight away and your aspect. How do you refocus your time, your mind, your energy and everything that goes along with that? Family. Family. You, me personally, I refocus by focusing on my family and giving the time that I, I always had time for my family. By the time, more time now for my family and my, my children's endeavours, their aspirations, their desires, Love that. what they want to fulfil. That's, that's, what, that's what I did. At the same time, um, obviously I continue my coaching badges, continue my destiny to become a coach. I always wanted to be a coach, always wanted to be able to give back to people, not just, the, not just academy players, you know, senior mm. players. I always wanted to give back something into the game, so I've done my badges. And then I started doing other qualifications that go in line with, with my badges, my skill sets. Because um, I'm a realist, you know, James. I've, I, I look around at the environment I'm in. I realise that I'm really, I love football. I realise how great football's been for me. Mm. And I've got nothing to say bad about football. But I realise once I stop becoming a professional football, if I desire to be a manager, if I desire to be a coach, there'll be other things that might stop me from being a coach. There'll be other things that might stop me, not because of my ability at all, because of perception. So I ain't stupid. I, I'm, very, I'm very real, very open about what I want to do and how I'm going to go about it. So if I've got time to waste 20 years fighting to be a manager that might never get the opportunity, or that I think I've got the qualities, or do I channel my energy and my, my focus into developing people? So I start doing other qualifications that are aligned with what I believe in. So I started doing other things, mental health awareness, corporate governance. Um, I started taking all sorts of different qualifications that align with my football skill sets, my football qualifications, but just not just I'm a B licensed coach that can only be a coach because I might not get the opportunity to work as a coach. Grow in your whole package. Exactly. So I had to make sure that I'd done other things that could give me an holistic approach because once you stop playing football, the money you've earned through football stops. So you need to have a job after or you need to have invested yourself well enough to make sure you've got money in. If you think, like, I want to go and get the same sort of accolades that I did as a player like my peers are in the game as managers and coaches it's not as easy as for me it should be it should be based on that but I'm, I'm not like I said I love the game so I'm not bitter about anything but I'm, I'm a realist do you understand I don't I'm not gonna sit down in my chair and think that well 25 years ago or 20 years ago all of these managers couldn't get a job what makes me what makes you well, why do I think that this, the situation is going to change enough for them to then give me a job do you understand so I've got to fight for what I want do you think there's an underlying issue Oh, what, in football? Yeah. Of course, of course. But like I said, I'm not one, we're not here to talk about what uh, the underlying issue. I'm just here to say that what I did after I played. I, I looked at the environment and I realised that I'm going to have to try really hard and I want to be a manager, I want to be a coach at a first team level, like so many of my peers. And I say peers, people that I played with, literally, mm -hmm. that are first team managers at first team coaching levels. Why is it so hard for other people to get there then? Very interesting know. point. It, it, it's, so instead of me bemoaning why it's so hard, instead of me trying to change people's mindset, I've got to make sure I focus on me. So that's what I did, as I've always done. Make sure I empower myself. Make sure I get myself qualifications. Make sure everybody I speak to, I try to give them a positive vibe, uplift them, because that's all I can do. I can't control everybody else. I can't control other people's mindsets. All I can do is make sure mine's correct. So I started getting qualifications. I started aligning myself with other qualifications that can take me into different environments, but I can still help development pe develop people. Does that make sense? Makes a lot of sense. Because football is my passion. Makes a lot of sense. Football is my passion. And if you ask me what I wanted to do, I'd be a first team manager. I'd love to be a first team manager. So what if I can't get the opportunity to be a first team manager? I've got to do something else. Be a first team coach. Exactly. I've got to make sure I empower myself to do what I want to do and not be held back or restricted by anybody not giving me the opportunity. I respect not, that. That's not down to anything other than I see the environment and I accept it 
I don't agree with certain things, but I'm not going to be moan and groan. I can't afford to do that. Do you understand? I ain't that kind of person. I have to be positive all the time. Talk to us about where you are now with yeah. your footballing journey and what, what's going on at the moment. So this brings me up to where I am now. So after I left, after Barking Abbey, um, Warren Hackett, who was a coach at Dagenham and Redbridge, asked me to be the under-15 coach as well. So I was simultaneously doing the college thing and being an under-15s coach. How did you find that? Brilliant. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Something tells me that you loved that, I being love football, yeah. being on the pitch I with the, the younger players. Yeah, I love more talking as well to them. Mm. So, yeah, I love being able to have a communication, not just on a football pitch, but saying to them how powerful you can be. Yeah. You understand? So anyway, yeah, after the under-15s, I progressed through Dagnum. So 15s to 16s to lead development, ultimately became the academy manager of Dagnum. So I was there for eight years. The last year I was there, they got relegated the year before. I knew, the club told me, look, if we don't get promoted this year, it's going to close because we can't afford to The run. academy's it's going to completely close. close. We're running it two years out wow. of the league. So if we don't get promoted in the second, it's going to close. So it's fine. It's There's a lot of money for the academy I'm taking to yes. run, development. Yeah. yeah, so the club got to put money in, the league put money in. Obviously, the club are not in that financial position to keep sustaining the academy if they're not in the league. Do you understand? Once they're in the league, the club, the, the, the league clubs, the, the, the governing body help facilitate your academy if you're a league club. If you're not in a league club, you have to facilitate the academy, son. Wow. Two years I had not been in the league. I know this club is not going to be able to facilitate. How me did this. you feel after eight years having to leave? Obviously, a life, job that you loved. It's life, it's life. I didn't feel any way other than, that's a shame. You're just trying to find a new thing. Per, per, any personal sympathy or any... Interesting. I did for the actual, the academy as a whole. Yeah, the, the, players, the players. Yeah, and the, the players that have been yeah, there and the players yeah, that are of playing. You feel for them, but not, not me as, on a personal level because what can I do, you know? I, so after that, I looked for other jobs in football because now I'm an A-licensed coach. I've been an academy manager for a good on eight, eight years. So I'm, so I'm looking solid around. professional, so, yeah, solid career. Got A-licensed, got all my badges, got my FYA, all the, all the stuff you need. So I'm looking around for a job, couldn't get one. Really? Again, fine. Went to several interviews, could not get a job. So this is the first time I've been out of work. W was you getting interviews yes, for jobs? Yes, I was getting interviews. Some, some I was, some I wasn't. Okay. So the first time I've been out of work here, yeah, and I've always heard about we can't get jobs and we can't... I've never been in that situation, James, because mm. from a professional footballer, I've always worked. Mm. The and you've, you've looked ahead and then lined up what you need right. for the right yeah, environment I've never for been the next step. Football as a, a qualified coach and have to go and look for a job. This is the first time it's happened, okay? So I don't know what the environment's like before that. I don't know people saying this, people saying that. I don't know, I've got a job, so I'm not mm. looking for another job. When I came out of that job now, I couldn't get another job. Now, I might not be the right person for the jobs I went for. So I don't blame, I don't, you know, there's no... If, if I was this, it's not, that's not the case. I was not, I got interviews, so I possibly was not the right person for the jobs I went for. And you know what, James, I wasn't. I wasn't the right person, because I'd never been to an interview in years, do you understand? So all the time I'm going for these interviews, after the interviews, I'm realizing, yeah, I should have done better there. I could have done better there. I'm learning. So it's understand? like a learning process learning. for yourself. Yes, yes. Interesting. By the time the last few interviews coming around, I started getting more rounded. I started talking more slower. Mm. I'm starting to articulate myself the way I want mm. to articulate. So instead of being nervous, wanting to... Do you understand? Because these things happen. Do you understand? So I started realising, yeah, you know what? To be fair, them first few interviews, that I wasn't the right person for the job. I wasn't. But only reflection... Sounds now, like but, a real self-journey as well. Yeah, like, uh, Yeah. So all through this self-journey, like I said to you, a few years ago, I started thinking about other things that mm. I can do, not mm. just in football. Do you understand? I started thinking about other things. So I started, I started getting a job like in multi-sports. So eventually, after I left Dagnum, um, couldn't get a job in football, I started doing other things where I could develop youths, you know? So I started thinking, how way can I influence youths and influence people using my skill sets and my qualifications? So I got a job in uh, UCL, a multi-sports officer, and mentoring youths, kids that are meant to be a bit off the track. Sorry, kids that are meant to be off the track or... Mm bad kids, delinquent kids or kids. I, had, I went and done some mentoring and I delivered a football coaching and a multi-sport in, in that school. Off the back of that, I saw a job in, in a QPR community, in the community, doing the same sort of thing, multi-sport, and da, da, da. I thought, yeah, I'd be interested in doing that. Plus, it's in a football club, so mm. I'm a bit, you know, I know a bit about football. It's a lot of synergy to what you've right. done in yeah, the past. Yeah, my passion is football and it's a yeah. lot of synergy, correct. Yeah. So I went and got that. In, I went to the interview at QPR and I got the job. And I remember saying to them, and they, they asked me several questions about development, and I was answering the questions and so on. I got the job, and I said to them, "The only thing I'll stop doing this for is football. The only thing I'll stop help doing development on the community side or helping disenfranchised kids or or anything like that is if I got a job back into football because football is my number one passion." And then just six months later, a job came up within the academy. 
I went through it. At the same time, another job came up in a different academy at exactly the same time, and I went for both of them, and I got both of them. Incredible. But I knew I was going to get the second job now, James, because I, I because of this one year of getting to these interviews and learning and learning and learning. When I went to these two interviews at QPR within the academy, and I went to the other interview, I went in there so confident. You've got the spill on lock. You knew exactly I, what, I was so, how yeah, to compose yes, yourself. I was so confident. Not because... I knew what to say, it's because I'm, my skill sets, because I, I'm, mm. I'm competent at doing it. I'm competent at the roles I was going for. So I went in there with so much confidence that um, I had a feeling that I might get offered the two jobs. So from not having no job a year ago within football and not being able to get one, to being able to get being offered two at the same time was, uh, was really good for, for myself. And, uh, Very inspirational. Yeah, it was, it, it was, it was, it was. It was inspiring to me. If that so makes now sense. you're now a big part of the Queen's Park Rangers Academy, is that right? I would say I'm part of the, Q- the, the QPR Academy. I would like to say a big part because every staff member's got, got a big role. So I would like to say I'm a big part. I help the under eight help to develop the under 18s, which is part of the academy. Obviously, they've got schoolboys down and they've got 23s above and they've got the first team. So I'm just part of the, the machine that's trying to help develop boys, yeah. Mm. Very interesting. Do you think there would be a room for ex-professional footballers to to be, like you said, coached on interviews, coached on techniques, there is. coached on there is things fair. that can Im- improve to round your, your whole shape, your character, your game, your skill set to get you in that next opportunity. To be fair, there is. Um, the PFA, um, they've been marginalised recently and things said about the PFA and recently, but for me personally, they do offer, they did offer me support. They've, they were good with you, that's what they you're was, saying. Yeah, they was, yeah. but they was good for, they, I say they was good for me because I went looking. Okay, Do you understand? I didn't sit down and wait for them to offer me anything. I went, I found out what courses they was doing, what? Yeah. Like my corporate governance course. That's a really, really good course that I'm glad that I did, supported by the PFA. So that gives you an acronym, not just a football coach, it gives you an idea of business and how to conduct yourself within the boardroom and stuff like that, which is very important. So they've, they've done things like this. Also, they do offer you uh, support as far as getting interview, mock interviews and stuff like that. So the PFA are doing a lot more than they did. I believe now than they did maybe when I first started out. So they do offer you that social, psychological support. They do. Um, maybe they should be more proactive in reaching out to players and doing it. Maybe they are. I don't know. But me myself, I went and seeked things that I know that I needed to do to go forward. Because like I said to you before, I ain't just gonna sit down and wait for someone to give me a job. It's not gonna work like that. Do you understand? It doesn't I work. Appreciate like that. that. You have to go out there and make sure that you you do what you need to do to get to where you wanna go. You know, in a positive way. Always in a positive way. If someone came in tomorrow, hypothetically, in the Football League, maybe Division 2, or maybe the Vanarama League, and said, look, we're going to offer you X, Y and Z, first team, to be the first team manager or first team coach of this football club, would that be something that you would take, an opportunity that you would grab? Of course. I wouldn't be daunted by an opportunity like that. Well, you know, it's, it, it, the opportunity in itself is daunting because you know what you're going into, but would I, I, would be, I wouldn't shut the responsibility. Of course, I would want to have the opportunity to. Why wouldn't I not to? Do you feel that's a natural progression for you in the future? Um, I'm not sure if it's a natural progression. It may be possibly should be a natural progression, not for, some, not for me, but probably for someone in my position. As far as I'm not unique, there is players that have played the game and are coaches. So when I say my position, I mean, I'm talking about us. Mm. It's just up down to an individual if they want the opportunity, you know. I'm not, I, I would like to be given the opportunity to, 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 to say well, yes or no. Do you understand? That's what, that's what I would like to give, be given the opportunity to say, yeah, I would or I wouldn't. But it's, it's definitely something that I'll be interested in doing. How else would I be able to measure myself? You can only measure yourself to so much in the academy, academy level. You can, you know. And the academy level is about development. It's not about winning. So what I had, my job now is not about winning. My job is to try and win in the long term for the players. So I try to develop them in the right way so they win eventually in the long term, not on a Saturday. When you talk about first team football, it's completely different. You have to win on that Saturday. So for me, that would be another challenge for me, yeah, in my, my own career, definitely. Do you think it's right that academy and academy football is non-competitive nowadays? Do you feel it's different? or Do you think it's improved from when you played academy football? No. In your opinion? F- the football itself remains the same. The football doesn't change. Football remains the same as it did 30 years ago, 50 years, 40 years. The dynamics around it change. Equipment, um, the, the size of the ball, the support network, the staff, you know, that's, that's changed a lot in my time. So the academy system now, you go through the categories, because the academy, there's tiers in the academy. There's Cat 1, Cat 2, Cat 3, and 4. So the higher the categories, the more support, more money, the more financial support. More infrastructure. For sure. The lower, the less. So 
in between and all of that, the football itself doesn't change. Good players are always going to be good players. Good yeah. players are always going to do good stuff. There's always going to be good players at Cat 4 and at Cat 1. It's just a support network and maybe the financial support that the players have got is, is definitely def a, lot, a lot different from our time. But it's technology, isn't it? Again, so. We get a lot of young academy players and a lot of parents of academy players that watch the channel. Um, could you explain the process of a 12-year-old or 13-year-old going on trial with, for instance, cute Queen's Park Rangers and how that, how that process would work? Yeah, first of all, now, when, when the, 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 the level of uh, people going on trial at QPR is, is very, what's the word, um, non-stressful. First thing is, is it has to be a non-stressful environment because you're taking some, a, a child from an environment to see if they can cope in a different environment. So you've got to make that transition as smooth as possible and as less... Uh, as less daunting to that young person as possible. So at QPR, we make the transition as smooth as possible. So when trial is coming to our groups, they go with someone that we, a trusted person, assigned. They're not left alone. They're paired up with someone that's already signed. So the two trialists don't go together. When we eat, when we eat together, trialist eats with us. He doesn't, he will, so we try and integrate that person in as much as we can. And so they, they feel as loved, because that's, that's what you want them to feel, as loved as they can, you know, so that if, if they are successful in progressing to the next level of the trial, then it's, it's a smooth transition. If they're not successful in, 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 in going to the next level of the trial, they've had a great ex experience with QPR. They've had a fantastic time with QPR, and that's all we want them to have, basically. And that's how most, you would like to think most academies would like to operate. So you want, you want to transition from one environment to the other environment as smooth as possible. If they don't make it, then in that in the environment that you're asking them to come into, that they can easily go back to their environment, but be enriched by the experience. That's do how we, we do you think there it. should be more done for academy prospects that don't make the grade, for players that aren't fortunate enough for whatever reason to be offered a professional contract by their club? Do you feel there could and should be more done for these players, in your opinion? A simple question I could say to that is yes. Now I'm saying they are. Be, I'm not saying they are not being supported, but. Yeah. Can you ever? Can you? Can, can you, it be improved? Exactly. Can can yeah. can you always support people more? Yeah. So I'm saying they might be getting a great level of support, but the question you're asking me is, could they get supported more? I'd have to say yes, because obviously how you know everybody would like to get supported more. These, so yeah. To answer to your question, I'm not saying they're not. I'm not saying by no means they're not getting the support. But you're saying should they get supported more? Then yeah, of course. Why not? When something's good, we want to keep doing it. So if you're supporting someone with, with uh, their financial support, their academic support. Um, their endeavours after football because they ain't made it, that should continue, yeah, for sure. I think you can always do more. Can we saw massive success for our nation's football team in the past, maybe not in terms of winning tournaments, but in terms of producing players. A lot of that's credit to the Lillyshaw system. We've seen France, again, copy that system and be very successful. The likes of Mbappe have came through that system. Would you like to see that whole system implemented again here in this country? Do you think it's something that could be viable in your opinion as a coach? The Lillyshaw system? Yes, the Lillyshaw system. That's a system. good question. Personally, I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, we had the, the, the Lillyshaw system, from my, my knowledge and my understanding, is they identified boys early. They picked 15 that's right. or 16 boys each yep. year from yep. across the country, yep. housed them in a special program. Yep. Um, as you can imagine, elite coaching, elite training, with football being their main thing that they did in life alongside their education. It's a very special thing. Yes, but also they earmarked these players. So they earmarked these players. So it's, so it's like me and you, James, saying, you know what, we're going to start a system, we're going to do something. Me and you are going to start, start a system, we're going to go and get 15 of these, these people out here and we're going to mould them and, and then we're going to earmark them in 10 years' time to play for England. Now, I'm not sure if that's the right way. And I understand that they was airmarking people already to play in the 2000 and World Cup from, from, from when they... Literally. Played. Now, I'm not sure if that's the right way because now you're not, you're not looking at a, a, talent of, a, a pool of talent that's coming after them, are you now? Because you're already airmarked these boys for stardom. Interesting. Now, I'm not sure if that's the right way. You know what I mean, I'm not sure if... I, I don't believe that is the right way. Do you understand? But the actual structure of what they try to do, I, you know, I, haven't got, I haven't really got an opinion about it. All I know is that to earmark people 10 years into the future, to me, is a bit wrong because anything could happen between then, now and then. Well, it did. We saw Indeed. A, a great Indeed. number of these, these top I talents know, haven't, haven't then, for whatever reason, grown fulfilled. into the player or fulfilled their, yeah, their potential. What they were earmarked to do when they got signed. So I, I, James, to be honest with you, I've, I've got a, what's the word? Mixed. 
Yeah, mixed, mixed opinion on it, or not really much of opinion on it, really, to be honest with you. You know, okay. like I said, I, I didn't come through that pathway. I was an elite player, so I know that it, you can make it. So whether they want to choose people to be elite and, 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 and give people more of an advantage than others, I think that'll always be the case in this society. So I don't really watch things like that too much, you know. People are always going to be getting treated differently to other people. So I, I don't really, I've, I haven't really got much of an opinion on if that should be introduced again. Personally, probably not. But if they do, it wouldn't surprise me. Interesting. Put it, put it that way. Mike, I've got to thank you for coming on Full Golf Football. It's great to spend some time here and get you on the channel. Um, I think it's only right that we give the last closing, closing sort of message to yourself. Anything you want to say to, to, your, to your friends, fans and people that are watching this video? No, no, believe in yourself. Control what you can control and respect everybody. No, that's, that's, all I, that's all I can say. And thank you for having me on the show. It was, um, it was great for you to come and sit down with me and it was great to sit down with you. And Mark... Jack, sorry. <laughs> Ed, Mark! <laughs> I've done the delivery, you know, a little bit. Good to have you with us, Mark. Thanks, Jack. <laughs> no, no, it was, it was fine. It was fine. I really appreciate it. Thank you very Is much for right? your time. No, it's been yeah. brilliant. It's great to get you on the channel, mate, genuinely. Thank you, Thank you very much.